I'm Christina Bosnakis. And I'm Gabby Godet, and you're listening to the TDN's Let's Talk. Welcome to another edition of Let's Talk, and we have a very, very special guest, especially special to both of us, Christina, Hall of Famer, D. Wayne Lucas. Obviously, many people, most people who know me know that I'm a lifelong fan of Wayne's, and I love him dearly, and I've gotten to know him the last few years, so it's just been tremendous, but we're also going to be joined by his lovely wife, Lori Lucas, who's equally wonderful and lovely and just all those good things so this is an episode you really don't want to miss you definitely don't want to miss it and we hope all of you enjoy well wayne first and foremost congratulations on a remarkable day another remarkable achievement with secret oak oath winning the kentucky oaks but i also wanted to uh let our viewers know where we are filming this from today which is the Derby Museum, and there's a phenomenal exhibit, Wayne, with some very- It makes me feel like I'm home. (laughs) Well, well, you know, to that point, Wayne, I was so fortunate, and I'm so thankful to Wayne and to Lori. They allowed me to go to their home to see the trophies in their home before they were moved to the Kentucky Derby Museum. And I got to tell you, Gabby, it was something- It was like a museum itself, first of all. It was out of this world. You could not even fully grasp how many trophies there were there were there, but also just the history that I was seeing, you know, and obviously Wayne, you know, I've made it no secret. I've been your biggest fan from, you know, day one. I've always been your fan. I always tell every, we have a joke with uh, Todd Pletcher. I always tell him, you know who my, you know, whenever he does something really nice for me, I say, oh, do you know who my favorite trainer is? And he says, D. Wayne Lucas, <laughs> like without missing a beat. But Wayne, you know, and that your trophy collection is just priceless. Well, I I really am glad that it's here in the museum. They they treated it very well. The exhibit's excellent. But I wanted to uh, make sure that it's it's shared by the fan base that we've developed over fifty or sixty years. So it it really has gotten a lot of exposure, and uh, we're probably pretty proud of that as much as anything. Wayne, we just have to talk, you know, Gabby, just to point it, you know, alluded to to Secret Oath's win. And of course, it meant so much, uh, obviously, to you and to your family and to all of us, really, uh, many of you who've been following you for many, many years. Um, I know it brought a tear to my eye uh, watching that whole thing. But just tell me a little bit about, I couldn't help but feel Obviously, you've won the big races before. That's not new. You won the Derby. You've won the Oaks. Uh, You won the Oaks several times. You've won the Derby several times. But somehow this one felt a little bit different. You know, in the winner's circle, I'm watching you on TV. Your family's there. Like, tell us a little bit about that. It it had to feel a little bit different than the previous ones. Well, there's a, as you know, there's a little bit of a gap there from the last one to this one, too. And uh, when you get to be my age, you probably think the racing gods aren't going to bless you anymore with a uh, secret oath filly of that caliber. So it was special. Uh, Brady, my grandson, my granddaughter, Kelly, uh, were there with their fiancés. It just was special. And uh, it, I love doing them with Lori, too. You know, it it's, uh, pulls us all together. These races become uh, milestones in not only your career, but in your family. And uh, so it was great to have us all there. And, uh, you know, I said earlier that when you win the first one, if you are blessed enough to win more than one. When you win the first one, you feel pretty good about yourself. You get kind of puffed up and thinking, boy, I did you know something very special. When you win after that, you start to realize that you have put your clientele in a very, very special place. You have given them the opportunity to enjoy that and to be part of it. Something that a small breeder like Rob and Stacy Mitchell would probably be very, very remote. The odds are tremendous that they would never be in that position. And yet you have done it. You've put them there. And so it becomes special. And you think back, a minute you're walking across the, the track there to get to the trophy presentation, you're thinking, you know, it's, I'm with my wife, my grandchildren are here, and Rob and Stacy Mitchell are going to experience something very special. 
Wayne, you talk about uh, Rob and Stacy, and you know, with such a talented horse, this is obviously not your first rodeo, but there have been really important decisions that have been made along the way, whether or not to run her in the Arkansas Derby or uh, keep her against Phillies after the performance in the Arkansas Derby with a poor trip, whether or not you run her in the Derby or the Oaks. And now we're on to the next step. And what do you do? Do you run in the Preakness? Do you not run in the Preakness? How much have you led those decisions or how much have uh, Rob and Stacy, how much input have they had in those uh, decisions as well along the way? Well, we don't take any of this lightly. We, we analyze it top to bottom. In, in this particular filly and with Rob and Stacy, we had some long conversations. We didn't make it overnight. We didn't take it very, didn't come about very quickly. We felt that we had the best horse in the Arkansas Derby. I, I think that today, I mean, I thought she was clearly the best horse there. Given a different trip and a little bit more of a racing luck, I think we'd have been fine right there. But having that behind us, it uh, made it, uh, very easy to move on to the next step. We had no intention of running in the Kentucky Derby. Rob and Stacy did not want to subject her to a 20-horse field. As you know, Gabby, the 20-horse field is hard to overcome, but not always every horse gets the trip there for sure. So we didn't want to subject her to that. We were thinking Oaks all the way. So the Oaks came together and we got it all back on track after probably a questionable ride in Arkansas or trip more than ride. And then we're now on the right track and we're, we're headed to the Preakness. Has there, just a follow up to that, Wayne, has there, at, has there been a situation along the way? I mean, I know you approach things, whether it be professionally or personally with a lot of confidence. <laughs> we know that. Oh, yeah. Has there, has there been any moment along the way where you have kind of second guessed yourself or second guessed a decision or has she given you confidence along the way? You know, surprisingly, she's, she's carried the banner very well. After the Arkansas Derby, we could have stepped back and said, whoa, that wasn't a very good trip and it was more of a tougher race than we had anticipated. But uh, the next two days or so, I said, you know, she's going to be just fine. And, uh, the nice part of it was we had a five-week window to get to the Oaks, and that was very important in our decision. I told Rob and Stacy, given five weeks, I'll have her right on the money. I said, I'm not a bit concerned about that. Had it been three weeks or two weeks or something like that, it would have been probably a little bit more difficult to make the decision to run in the Oaks. But with five weeks, given five weeks, anytime you give us five weeks, we're going to be tough. Wayne, you know, Gabby just said something which I find very interesting. She speaks about that confidence. And of course, you go, you've always moved forward with with that type of confidence. Sometimes, as we, you know, we've discussed this before, sometimes with the media, it's not you that are, you're not second guessing yourself. Sometimes the voices, the outer voices, especially now with social media and that whole, whole thing, um, sometimes the voices, you know, the critics come out, whether they know or they don't know what's really going on, uh, and they weigh in on these subjects. How does that make you feel? Has that changed from, let's say, 30 years ago to now when you have those voices weighing in and they're saying things that are just in some instances just wrong? Well, I'll answer that three ways. Number one, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you're probably right. The other thing is, uh, believe it or not, I don't listen to those voices. I don't read them. I don't follow them. I don't listen to them. And I know that uh, I love the fact that we're doing this and people can share our thoughts on the Philly and the upcoming races. But frankly, I don't, I don't read them. First of all, I don't have that phone that I sit there 24 hours a day looking at. Uh, that flip phone doesn't do that. And uh, so I don't read them. I don't let them, any outside uh, influence, you know, affect what we're going to do. My coaching background from years ago, I thought long ago to be thick skinned. So every once in a while, somebody will say, well, they so and so said this or that. It doesn't affect me at all. 
You, I saw an interview a couple weeks, or I guess it was a week ago before the Oaks, and someone brought up your poem, and hey, I think oh, alluded. Sorry, one of them or all of them or <laughs> the the most recent one about um, running out of time. Oh yeah, and. I think your response was, well, I'm not retiring and I'm not dying. So I don't know, I don't know what you're getting at here. Um, but it is true that in this industry, Wayne, there aren't people winning oaks and derbies at your age and out at the barn on the pony every single morning at, at your age. Um, is do you again kind of tying it back to the media, do you feel like do you feel that there's, I, I don't know that pressure is the right word, um, but I guess there is pressure. Like, do you, how do you feel about that? That people are kind of forcing this storyline on you that, you know, between um, having so many years between winning your last Oaks and this Oaks and the poem that you've been writing poems for years and years and years, and now they want to kind of force the story that this is your last hurrah. How do you kind of feel about that? Well, first of all, that poem was misread a little bit. When it got on the internet by accident, running out of time, a lot of my friends thought that maybe I had some illness or something, and I was uh, counting the days. It, it wasn't meant to be that. It was just a, a poem where I felt at 86 that I realistically are probably running out of time. The last line, you know, I will treat and love everyone as they were truly mine because I no one realized I'm running out of time. So it, it, in our industry, the, um, the fact that you get to my age, most people wonder if, is he up? Is he out there? Is he doing it? Uh, has he lost that step or two? Is he not, uh, as sharp as he used to be? So you get to a point where they maybe turn to a younger, voice, a younger person. Uh, and yet this whole game is experience. It is so paramount to have the, you're married to a young trainer. He's got a lot to learn and he will, and he will feel different when he's 60 than he does today. Trust me. And you learn by experience. There's nobody out there helping any of the younger guys that, you know, trying to get him, uh, move forward or teach him. So, you um, you think that maybe the public is, or at least the media is trying to retire you. And yet, if you're in it and sitting where I am on that pony every morning, I think, hell, let's get one next year. I really think we got good two-year-olds. We might get one next year. Mm -hmm. Well, Wayne, you know, that makes me think of something um you know, two things actually, and I'll start with the first. My, my, as you know, my husband is a horseman as well. And I've spoken with Gabby about this, you know, that as a horseman, um, sometimes horsemen don't really, and horse people in general, but I find horsemen specifically, don't really want to touch on um, any type of, I'll give you an example. Again, my husband's a farrier. So he doesn't want any, <sighs> idea or thought out there or talk about any physicality any issue with him he gets really really staunch about it Wayne like you know I don't I don't want people to have any idea if I'm hurting I'm going to play through the pain and I suck it up and I just move on because you know that's what I do and I find it's a tough business for people and it has to be tougher even as you know, you get on in years, as you said, you have more experience, but also, you know, the years, you know, things change from when you're 30 to when you're 60 or to when you're 80. So what do you think about that? Well, you know, I get up at 3.30 every morning. Now, at my age, when that alarm goes off, if it does go off, I usually beat it. But if it does go off at 3.30 in the morning, at my age, you, you might tip back and say, whoa, boy, I mean, maybe today and yet, uh, I refuse to let myself do that. I refuse to let the old man in, as Clint, what is, Clint uh, uh, said in the movie, the, I think it was The Mule, don't let the old man in. I don't let the old man in either. I, I want to be out there 
mixing with the younger people that I have on my staff and everything. And I get kind of a guilty feeling if I don't do that for some reason, which uh, is very, very seldom. So I, I can relate to what your husband's talking about there. We do not want to be put in a box as older people. And we want to be put in the boxes as somebody that's got the experience and going to get the job done. You mentioned that when you're in this game for 60 years or longer or about that time frame, your perspective changes a little bit with that experience. Um, and I kind of want to take a deeper dive into that, Wayne, that not only from a professional standpoint, but a personal standpoint, if you look at every uh Every professional athlete that has achieved greatness, whether it be Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, uh, I'm blanking on other ones, but um, they are committed to their career. There's nothing else that's going on. They're committed to their career. Their career is number one, and that's why they achieve greatness. Um, do you think your per perspective over the course of the past 60 years has changed a little bit personally and professionally, and, and how do you think it has changed, if it has? Well, it's interesting you'd ask that. Uh, Gary Player, the great golfer, called yesterday. We had a, about a 40-minute conversation, and uh, part of it was talking about how do you feel? Are you still got it? Are you still out there? He's uh, physical fitness, not, you know, he very fit. He's my age. He shot, uh, he played in a tournament the other day and shot 18 strokes under his age. Shoot, that says something. But anyhow, when you get a little bit older, you do not let the highs and the lows get to be that effective on your whole outlook. You stay a little bit in the middle. I don't get upset when I lose and I don't get as high when I win anymore. I get, I've been able to kind of stay in the middle. I don't worry about the setbacks. You handle the real unfortunate setbacks, like losing a good horse along the way, an injury, getting scratched out of a derby or something. You handle that a lot better when you've been seasoned to it. You just become a little bit more in the middle and not worrying so much. And the other thing is you don't wake up every day trying to prove that you can train a racehorse. You know, wake up every day and say, gosh, I've got to go out there and do it. i got to show them I can do it. You're very content with what you've got so far and just hope that you can maybe do it again. But you get a little bit more uh, vanilla about the whole thing. <laughs> that's a great way. Wayne, <laughs> that's a great way of putting it. Uh, you know, it makes me think, Gabby's question makes me think of um, the book we did together, Sermon on the Mount. And we had, you mentioned Gary Player. We had the foreword was written, as you know, by a good friend of yours, Bill Parcells, uh, the football great. And he had said something that really, really resonated with me and it stuck with me. He was, because he was speaking about himself, but he was also saying that, you know, it was a little bit also, it was, he was very connected to you in this way, that when you were both were at the height of your careers, that to Gabby's point, that, that focus, that laser focus allowed you to be successful and allowed you to achieve those heights, but something else on the other side gave right? There's always, there's a, there's a price you pay to a degree that when you focus like that on one thing, something else might drop. And he was talking for himself. He was saying about, you know, relationships or family or that kind of thing. You don't have as much focus. How do you think, first of all, what's your take on that? And secondly, how do you think, has that changed for you over the course of the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years? We're both, we're so alike, we're both wired that way. But the thing that happens is when you're successful, success, you breed success. And if you got that uh, drive and that competitive spirit, and like Bill said, it's always one more Super Bowl, one more uh, this, one more that. And that's how I get, I find my, catch myself too. Uh, I didn't uh, hardly get the Philly cooled out, and I was thinking, I wonder if Summer Promise and a couple other Phillies I got, Naughty Gal, can maybe get there next year. I'm already thinking about next year's Oaks, and that's the way we react. And uh, 
I think that it, it, you got to be intense. And what he said about that intense, giving up a lot of other things, it does. The marriages, in a relationship with your family. I'm just now really getting to know my grandchildren. I, you know, really know them. And, um, you, uh, you give up a lot if you're in that arena, such as Bill and put Gary Player and people like that. They know the difference. Was it a decision that you made, though, Wayne, or was it just kind of uh, you didn't it – w- it wasn't this or that. It wasn't that, oh, I'm focusing on, like, a work-life balance. I'm, I'm thinking about – or was it just there was no other option. You're just dialed in. You want to win the derby. You want to win derbies. You want to win oaks. You want to be at the best. It just happens. I, I, don't, I don't know what I, how I could stop it. It, it just comes natural. That's the first thing I think of, you know, and I do it on the third race on Wednesday too. I, um, I maybe am competitive to a fault. I really, really enjoy the competition, but I really enjoy it in the main arena, taking on these young guys. I love it. Well, okay. So that's a great point because you have this innate competitiveness in your DNA. There's no other way about you. That's your constitution. There have been many years that went from your last Kentucky Oaks win to this Kentucky Oaks win. In that period of time, Wayne, I mean, you've won big races in between. You've won, you've had some nice horses and allowance horses and and really not impressive uh, maiden races. But you, like you said, you weren't at that level. How much did that did it did it upset you? Like, what were the emotions that you felt during that time frame? I guess is. I think that I think searching for it, going through that journey, just fuels the fire. I I never really stopped. I don't think trying to get there. I mean, there was a gap of some years, but of course, we like you pointed out, we've had other wins and everything too. But the ones you want on your resume are the Kentucky Derby, the Breeders' Cups, or the old. You know, those are the ones that you, when they roll around in April, you start thinking, "Gosh, I'd like to be in there this year," or "I'm going to be in there this year." But I think the competitive spirit never. I never thought we can know that one iota. Wayne, uh, I wanted to, to uh, pivot a little bit uh, off of that. You know, I had a co- I spoke, I mentioned um, Dallas Stewart a little bit earlier, and obviously you are so associated with the people that many of the people who worked with you. In fact, we had Kieran McLaughlin on our last podcast, and he had the most wonderful things to say about you. So he spoke so, 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 so highly that you had such an impact on his life. And I had spoken to Dallas prior to us writing the book. And one thing that he said to me that stayed with me was this. He made it a point to say that even though you are very much self-assured, like you know what you want to do, you know what you want to do, you know how you want to proceed, you have a very good sense of how the direction you want to go into. However, you will also take a moment to listen when one of your staff the people that work with you, Dallas said, if you, if you give him a, like you, like if you talk to him and you say, you know what, I think you should do this. And this is my explanation for why you should do this, that you will consider it. And you may still end up doing what you were going to do originally, but you also may sometimes adjust a little bit based on that. And I think that really was, that really resonated with me. If you could tell us a little bit about that, just the importance of, you know, taking that input from the people who surround you. First of all, nobody in thoroughbred racing is teaching very much. You know, we don't have very many young guys, older fellows that are, you know, trying to share. You know, it's such a competitive industry with such high dollars involved with it that nobody is sharing anything. You know, you take a football coach like Nick Saban or somebody that's very successful he will get up to the blackboard and hold a clinic and share everything that he does. There's nobody doing that in racing. In our organization, we say we're going to have five minutes of democracy in the morning, and then the czar will take over. 
So for five minutes in the morning, we let them bounce those ideas off me. And Dallas uh, knows that. Sebastian, my current assistant, will question the chart, will question the set list. And uh, I listen to them. And uh, the worst thing I do is if I don't agree with it, I just go dead silent and don't say anything. But I try to try to have an interaction with them. But we only have five minutes of democracy in the morning. One man can train a hundred horses. Two men cannot train one. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's true. Yeah, that's true, right? It, well, it's true, you know, and I think I think really because what happens is that's where we see an interesting dynamic, an interesting trend develop in racing where you have a lot of input. Like we're in the old days, and when I say the old days, that even goes back to, I would probably say, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you didn't, the, the trainer was making, calling the shots. I can't, it really wasn't a thing where the owners or there were other people that really were weighing in on training the horses. But Wayne, now it seems like there is, there's a lot more input coming in from racing managers, from owners. It's not just the trainer anymore, right? Sometimes even well, agents. <laughs> Yeah, we try to ignore the uh, racing managers. We try to, <laughs> we're very really polite about the owner's uh, input. We're real polite about that. We're very polite. But what it happens is, in my particular case, I hired some really sharp young guys that were absolutely going to be successful, whether they were in our program or met me at any time. They were guys that you could really, really depend on. And then when they came with suggestions, Jeff included, my son, Todd Pletcher, Dallas Stewart, Mike Baker, Karen McLaughlin, they all had pretty good sound ideas. And I was able to step back and let them do this and do that. And if you want to know the truth, probably for 20 or 30 years, they carried me on their shoulders. They were really sharp young guys that I knew when they got out. I knew the minute Todd hung his own shingle out and Dallas hung his out, Karen hung his out. I knew here they come. They're going to get tough and they're going to start beating us too. You mentioned your assistance. And Wayne, my dad was a longtime horse trainer in the Mid-Atlantic. And we had good help. We had bad help. He would tell me stories along the way. But there were kind of like a top three of big no-nos. <laughs> if, yeah. if you did this, you're not coming back. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm just curious what your kind of top three uh, no-nos were. And that, you know, if you're, if he would hate people that weren't on time, if you're five minutes late, I, you can tell me any excuse in the book, goodbye. You're not coming back the next day. Um, honesty was a big, a big part of, of the, the no-nos. Um, and just having a good work ethic, just a good attitude. So those are kind of like his top three, but I'm just curious along the way with your, all of the phenomenal assistants that you had, um, what were their kind of their best attributes? And then also the people that didn't last, why didn't they last? Yeah, they're, they're really, there's, uh, there's a nice group of guys that are very successful out there, but there's some of them that are washing cars and bagging groceries at Kroger too, that didn't last. Here's the deal. When you go into a program like we had and take on a Todd Pletcher or take on a Dallas Stewart, you have to under, they have to understand that if they don't pan out, if they don't work and become successful, you, meaning me, have, wasted two or three years also. They all say, well, I'll do anything. I'll clean stalls. I'll work late. I'll be there on time. I say, that's all fine and good. We're going to test you on that. But if they don't pan out and if they don't fall in the line, then you've wasted two or three years. On your big three or no-nos, three no-nos, work ethic. Number two, they have to, they have to buy into the brand. They have to believe what we're doing. They have to drink the Kool-Aid. If they don't buy into it and they feel, I feel a little friction where they don't believe that or hell, I don't think that's a good idea. They only get so many times like that and then they are gone. But work ethic, buying into the brand 
and just being a good person, have great character. They have to have some character. I don't want the F word. I don't want all the dirty stories. I don't want any of that in the barn. It's got to be on a high plane. I tell them right from the get-go, don't let the racing community drag you down to their level. And I don't say that, you know, in a bad way, but the, the racing community will, in, if you let it, will, you'll start using he done good instead of he very well. They'll drag you down on their language. It gets very easy to start swearing every other word. And I always tell them, do not let the racing community drag you down to that level. You rise above it. You continually raise the bar. Wayne, speaking of raising the bar, um, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago, you mentioned your son, Jeff. And obviously, you know, we've talked about this. Uh, we've heard you talk about this, how important he was to your organization. Again, we just had Kieran on and he talked about Jeff and just what kind of superstar he was and just tremendous, just a tr tremendous trainer in his own right. And Wayne, it ha when you have somebody that's that integral to your organization, but is also your family, is your son, and you lose him, that has to, even though you were operating at a super, super high level at that point in your career, like that was in the 90s, that was just, that was like a, a zenith, right? That has to, has to really throw you has to throw things in a tailspin a little bit. How do you write the ship? I know you had told a story. Maybe you could repeat the story for Gabby and our viewers as well about Randy Bradshaw and how he stepped up. But how do you write the ship when something that big hits you? Well, th that was a difficult time. And of, of course, the reaction in the barn was that Tabasco Cap was a, a bad horse. So the first thing we tried to fix is that we decided that we were going to make Tabasco Cat as good as we could. We were going to, the Hollywood ending would have been if he'd have won the Kentucky Derby, and then gone on to win the Preakness and the Belmont. He won two out of three, but if he'd have won that, they would, they could make a, a Hollywood movie out of the whole deal. But what happens is when that happened, I reached out and adopted those guys we're talking. I, they, I became closer to them. I depended more on them. Uh, I spent all of the time that uh, Jeff was in a coma. I would go to the barn at 4 a.m. and then straight to the intensive care unit and uh, hoping that that was the day when he would come out of the coma. The, uh, the thing that was so, everybody stepped up. Randy Bradshaw had his own division, had 30, 40 horses right across from me. He turned it over to his assistant come over and ran mine for those 30 or 40 days. And that's the way everybody stepped up. Dallas was really tight, and Todd was very tight to Jeff. And all of them just picked up the slack. But personally, I looked at them all like they were all family, and they still are. I adopted every one of them at that moment. It just seems like they all stepped in so that – you could kind of take a little bit of a breath, Wayne. I mean, this is an intense tragedy that happened to you. And, you know, when you have this, when you have such a, an operation that was your operation during that time, um, I, I just, I can't imagine having to wake up at 3.30 the next morning and go to the barn and just have this weighing on your mind. On the other hand, we won the national title for Races won. We won it for stakes one. We won it for money one that year. We had a little bit of a break there, a window of time when everything was unsettled because of that, losing Jeff. But we regrouped. And that year, believe it or not, we won the whole thing again. And uh, it says a lot about those guys that, you know, were in those roles that we're talking about. They were special. But Wayne, it also, I think, says a lot about you, too, because even just now, like you're not you're not a glass half empty guy. You're definitely a guy that's a glass like, a you know, a glass half full or, or you know, mostly full kind of person. You know, you're always you always seem to move from the positive. You always seem to move in that direction rather than the negative. Don't you think that also filters down to the oh, whole okay. operation? 
I wouldn't even, I, when I'm on the phone and these young guys would be talking to uh, any of the clients, they'd hang up and I'd say, do not end that conversation on a negative note. Do not. If you've got a filly that's got a, a shin that's hot, tell them. But don't stop there. Be sure and tell them that the colt worked 35 flat this morning. And uh, we're really excited about him. Never end up on a negative note on anything. And as far as that glass being half empty or half full, mine runs over. <laughs> Bravo. Exactly. That's my point. But that's my but you know what? I think that run it over. It's <laughs> a good name for a horse, actually. But um but Wayne, I think, you know, you kind of actually that goes that kind of goes into another area which I think people always make it make a point. They always talk about how the business side of racing that you really spent not only you developed like in in horse racing the trainers in the 70s let's say you know 60s 70s it was a different type of deal to be a trainer mm -hmm. then as we went into the 80s of course with you coming along you changed the landscape people talk about that from a business perspective you had an office you had an actual full-on office with people working in there, running the business side, you know, you were much more hands-on. But something you just said now as well is there was a lot to do with image. There's a lot to do with, you know, where you're saying you're teaching people even like it's a playbook. It's, it's like you, it's like how you get people to respond to you, how you get people to have like a better opinion, like, you know what I mean? To leave on a positive note. It's a whole thing. It's not just the business aspect that you developed well you can here's the thing when i came along there's a couple of things that we decided we must do first of all if a guy gives a quarter of a million dollars he i don't think wants to ask if he can see it at the barn and get permission to come to the barn and the trainer's whittling and chewing Redmond that's running down his cheek. I don't think that that's going to sell anymore. I think these these very successful men that are wanted to get in the business and they want to have somebody that is in their image or their attitude all the way across. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that as you go along, we felt that every horse should have a place that was profitable. Not all of the players in the NFL, drafted or not, can play in the NFL. A lot of them fail. A lot of them will get very successful. Not all horses can run in Santa Anita, Belmont, or Saratoga, or here at Churchill. So we decided that we would, if we were going to get everybody in the game and make it profitable, we wanted all of them to be successful. So we started grading. We took the horses that could run at Santa Anita or Belmont or Saratoga. That was one group. If they dropped a little bit lower, we sent them to Monmouth Park and that group. And we had a stable at Monmouth Park. If they weren't good enough there, we sent them to Ellis or even all the way down to Omaha at the time. So every horse was starting to produce. Some of them weren't making the big bucks in the big stakes. Some of them were. But at, with that, that conglomerate, started kicking in a lot of good wins, a lot of uh, income for our owners, and we had a lot of happy guys that were, you know, smiling on Saturday and going to the bank on Monday. Times were good. <laughs> so where does that well, come from? Wayne, where does that come from? Because you were, I'm always fascinated when someone completely changes the course of a sport or the course of an industry or a company um, and that is what you did for horse racing. You kind of paved the way of this new concept. Where did that stem from? Was there knowledge from, say, sports or I, I'm just curious where you what was the platform that kind of created these ideas and the, these new concepts? I don't know. I think a little bit from my coaching background, it always bothered me. Uh as uh, as the freshman coach at Wisconsin and when I was a head coach at Lacrosse Logan High School, it bothered me that I was able to develop six or seven kids and give them a certain experience. And there were seven or eight or 10 on the team that I, I really 
couldn't influence in that area. They just weren't good enough. And they were good kids, hardworking kids, kids that had the dream as much as the ones that were playing. And that always bothered me a little bit. I tried to influence all of my players. So when I got into horse racing, I, I was very upset if we had two or three horses that didn't turn out, especially if I bought them. And I wanted to make every one of them profitable. I'll tell you a cute story. I, I ended up buying and claiming the mother of Lady Secret and $35,000. I bought her privately after a race, which she ran at Atlantic City. And uh, I got her eventually. And when the career was over, I wanted to breed her to one of my favorite horses, Secretariat. Now, I thought that was a marriage in heaven. This wonderful filly being bred to Secretariat. When the fall came in Oklahoma in the paddock, in my little ranch in Oklahoma, and I first went out there to see it, I was sick. <laughs> I was sick. This ratty little skinny thing. How could Secretariat have a daughter that didn't have any more substance than this one? So we put her on the back burner, and lo and behold, Gene Klein, one of the chargers and one of my key clients, wanted to buy some weanlings. So we put her in a package and we sold her to Gene Klein. Now, I got to the point where I was worried about making it work. He had given 200000 for her, and I thought, boy, we got to make this work. we got to make this work. So I told Jeff, I said, take her up to Bay Meadows and run her in a little race up there and we'll at least win a race for him. We can't just, you know, not make it work somewhere. So he takes her up there. Doesn't call me, didn't have cell phones, and doesn't call me till about nine o'clock. I said, How'd that turn out? He said, Dad, you wouldn't believe it. She run plumb off the screen. It looked like two races. I said, What? He said, She won by so far you, you just couldn't believe it. And I said, Wow, what a bad bunch you caught. He said, I don't know. He said, I don't know. He said, I think this is a good one. Little did we know she was going to win 11 grade ones in one year and be horse of the year. <laughs> I mean, but that goes with trying to make it all work. This game continues to surprise you and also keep you humble. That's kind of the common theme each and every single year. You And a good one can come from anywhere and look like right. anything. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. We just, saw it. we just witnessed it in its finest form. Yep. That horse, when he dropped into the rail and ran by <laughs> Epic Center, that... We just saw it again. <laughs> and we know now that there will always be 20 head every year in the Kentucky Derby. I feel kind of, I apologize to Steve Aston said, I know I cost you the Kentucky Derby by scratching that horse in. And now here I'm sitting here trying to beat him in the Preakness. I'm beating <laughs> up on him. <laughs> exactly. Take from our conversation with D. Wayne Lucas to thank our sponsors, including Healthnetics. All guests today will receive a premium CBD gift set from Healthnetics. For everyday aches and pains and an overall sense of calm, try Healthnetics CBD. All Healthnetics products are all natural, made in the USA, and are THC free. Healthnetics products come with a 100% money back guarantee. Go to healthnetics.com and use that promo code TDN for 25% off. We'll be right back after these messages. I met my wife at the Derby restaurant, which is the local steakhouse. Found out that she was an animal activist. We talked about it. I asked, asked her if she'd ever seen our side of the game. And sure enough, I brought her out. Complete turnaround. She sees how they treat these beautiful animals. It's just amazing. The care that they get is better than we take care of human beings, to be honest with you. 
And that was a word from our sponsor, First Racing. And now we'll rejoin the conversation with D. Wayne Lucas and his lovely wife, Lori Lucas. So obviously, you know, everybody who knows me knows that I'm a big Wayne Lucas fan. Everybody knows that. <laughs> and then as for even for my mother, my family, and you know, now we have, we're bringing in uh, Lori Lucas and Lori, you really have, you really jumped into that. I honestly, I have to say, it's like, it's like considering that if for some reason my, my father had to find or was in a position where he had to bring somebody else into the picture, I would have hated her no matter what. And I think a little bit with Wayne, that was the case. Like it had to be somebody that was absolutely remarkable to come into his world that I was going to love uh, just as much as I, I love Wayne, right? Like it's true. Like I was, there was never going to be anybody good enough, but, but Lori, you have like, you far surpassed like anything I could have imagined. But Lori, maybe you can just start by telling us a little bit about what do you think is the the foundation of your relationship with Wayne? Why do you think it works? Well, we both have a background in the horse industry, and I've had a, a business myself for since the seventies, and still do. And I, I just feel like that we, we both get it. We, you know, by listening to the earlier questions, I, I, I just understand that passion that you guys were talking about. I understand that drive and there's no judgment. And, you know, I'm not going to be complaining about why we can't go to dinner tonight and why we can't do this. And cause I get it. <laughs> so that, that really helps. Also, I, I have such great respect for her as a horse person. And, um, I don't have to go home at night and hold a clinic or a seminar on uh, what we're trying to do or where we're trying to go. When I first started, I mean, I my father was a trainer. Mom was his right-hand man. Uh, my sister is a trainer, so I understand the lifestyle. But still, when I first started dating Norm, um, <laughs> I would want to go to dinner and I'd want to go here and I'd want to go there. And he kind of was like, nope, this is, that's not going to happen. So is that, do you think that that's really what makes it work? And, and how do you, what are those conversations like at the end of the day, when you have a good day or when you have a bad day, when, when you come home at the end of the day, what are those conversations? Like, do you talk business? Do you talk about family? Do you talk about other things? Like what, what is that dynamic like at the end of the day when you get home? Well, we definitely talk about horses. <laughs> you know, we, I, I find that this part of the industry, since I've been in a different part of the horse industry my whole life, you know, I, I'm learning all the time. So we talk a lot about horses and what's going right, what's going wrong. And, um, and of course, we talk about our families and, and what's happening with them. But, um, and I find the, the whole business very interesting, you know, how, how it's, how it operates, how, um, he deals with customers, uh, the financial part of it. Just, it's just a fascinating business to make it work. Number one, you know, to, so we talk about everything. Lori's outstanding in her dealing with the clientele. When the clientele show up, I used to have to, you know, deal with them. I don't even have to look over there. Now she's, she steps right in and they just love her anyhow. And uh, so she handles it and she explains the things, you know, the black beauty part of it and everything. And uh, it takes me off the hook. She's outstanding with the client. That's a big part of it. And for those who don't know our viewers, Lori, what is your background in the equestrian world? Well, I grew up like a lot of young girls um, and was fortunate enough where I had a family that supported that. I grew up riding hunters and jumpers in Oklahoma and um, then attended college and graduated from Colorado State University. And I, I have been in Colorado, our business is still out there in Colorado, and I, I do go back and forth. So I transitioned into the Western world. I ride a lot of Western horses now, but um, I taught riding since the 70s. I, I graduated at, um, from Colorado State, and then I went into my own business, and I've taught riding and um, brought up a lot of 
youngsters in the horse world. And, and my niche has been more um, in the, the entry level type rider that I teach and sharing a lower level of, of horse showing. Um, so many trainers aspire to be training at a high level and, um, and, and always trying to go to the big horse shows and compete in the big arena. And I've actually enjoyed my niche um, in the entry level. She's missing one thing here. She's been a AQHA quarter horse judge for 22 years all over the world. And you know, that doesn't just happen. She's for 22 years, she carried a judge's card. And I'm telling on you now. <laughs> judge in the United States and overseas and everything else. She's, she's being modest here, but she's a good one. So I have a, I have a question that I was thinking about, um, and I actually discussed it with Gabby a little bit the other day because I really, I genuinely wanted to know to have both of your take on this. Wayne, when I did a, a sit down interview with you a few years ago for the TDN, I, I had asked you a question of your advice on marriage because I was about to get married, right? So now we're, we're over that part, obviously. <laughs> So we we moved past that part, and now we're you know we've been married for several years, and I have a question in that what Lori was just explaining to Lori, you came into this marriage, you had your own thing, Wayne, you had your own thing, <laughs> and you now come into a union. You're clearly two very strong, confident people in yourselves, and I like to think like myself and my husband, and. How do you make that when you have two people that basically have their own, you know, their own investments, their own assets, their own, they basically have a life before you came together. How do you make that work? And how do you make it work smoothly? <laughs> I want to know. Very, it's very easy. I can sum it up in one sentence. I always let her have my way. <laughs> I, when he said it was very easy, I was wondering where he was going with that. No, I, 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 <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be that easy. <laughs> and, uh, and that makes it work. You know, somebody's got to give and take in, in it. But I think that um, if you – my, I, funny you say that because a, a couple asked me today about uh, being married and what I, my advice was. I think that you can't get complacent and I can't – you can't get comfortable. Don't get too comfortable. Tell your wife you love her every day or else somebody else will. <laughs> we met late in life, and, and that was good. We were, Both of us had not had the best um, goes in, in relationships before, so we, we've had lots of um, – We've had lots of experience and we, we set back. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm in my seventies, he's in his eighties, and so we're you know, we're we've got it figured out. <laughs> neither, neither, one of us, neither one of us ever thought that we would, you know, get into a relationship again. And uh, yet it has really worked, you know, and uh she does so many things that make it easy for me to do what I'm doing lately, and it really is special relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you this earlier, Wayne, too, and I never really had the opportunity to, but I feel that me personally, um, if I have a stressful week and I have time, um, my outlet is I, I love to paint and draw. That's my outlet. Um, you and I were speaking about this several weeks ago in Arkansas, too, um, how, you, you know, your love of not only writing poetry, but reading poetry as well. Um, for both of you, I guess this question, both of you can answer this. This is a all-consuming lifestyle that we live. And I'm curious what those outlets are for both of you. Um, Wayne, is it is it the poetry? Is it reading and writing? Is it... Um, you know, passing information on to the next generation. What are those outlets for you both? Well, I like to gamble. <laughs> I but, was going to say that. I was yeah, going to say that. I, I like to <laughs> that works too. I'll tell you what, I like to go to the casino and gamble. And uh, Lori, uh, she, 
She's not too high on that, and uh, she doesn't like to do it, and she goes along with it. But I I find that if I'm playing on a, a, a slot machine, for example, it blocks out all of the things that are going on around me. You People that play on slot machines, you could set fire to the casino behind them, and they're so intent, they don't even, <laughs> they don't even know it. But I block out everything, and playing winning or losing is not that important to me, and I do win once in a while, and I, and I lose a lot. Lori keeps score. <laughs> I do not. I, I, uh, I tried to. I tried to get her to you know sit next to me, but that is never going to happen. But one of the elements that I find is if if I can get involved with a young person in some way, I really like. I like to to uh, try to influence those kids. I'm talking about nine, ten year olds. Gabby, I hope I'm not too old, but get that guy of yours a little older and send him with me for a couple of weeks. And <laughs> I love that. I love, Gladly. I, love, I love that part of it. And uh, Lori goes along with it. We'll we'll send a jacket to Chris Cox's son, for example, or something like that. I, that it's a great satisfaction for me. Mm-hmm. And Lori, what about you, Lori? I'm sorry, were you, were you saying, Gabby? You can't get out of this question, Lori. You have to answer yeah. it, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, we, I stay pretty involved with my business, so that's um, and I know that's not, you know, it, just in downtime. But I still really love that, even though I'm running it from afar and, and going back and forth. It's it's been great. But um, we have a property that is just fantastic, and we're so fortunate to so blessed to be out there. And and so I we have two dogs, and I spend time with the dogs. That's that's probably my nature I'm, I'm a little addicted to nature <laughs> we got, a, we, got an art, we got we live in a log cabin in five acres of woods you know i mean heavy woods dense woods she's figured out how to wind, wind and walk <laughs> through it all and take the dogs i don't even attempt it but uh we seem isolated out there and yet we're pretty close to louisville but it, it's been fortunate that we found this log cabin and we got a guest cabinet that you need to come in sometime. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we'll be out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, I, Lori, I wanted to ask you a question. Now, I'm not sure how well, how much of Wayne you knew about before you became involved with Wayne uh, personally, but what was one of maybe – what was I don't know if the surprise is a good word, but what was one of the the things, or maybe one of the biggest surprises you had when you actually got to know Wayne versus you seeing D Wayne Lucas, you know, just seeing the the, the image of D Wayne Lucas. Do you know what I mean? Was there anything that you found that was a surprise to you? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when I met him. Um, it was just a chance meeting, and and um, I was just not um, super impressed. I, I thought he was really full of himself, and I mean, I've known of him for years and years, like everyone else. And but I just thought, you know, he's a cowboy, and and uh, you know, he has a bit of an ego. And so I, but then it, the first time we actually had a conversation on the phone. It was a totally different deal. I, he has so much depth. Um, the conversations were fascinating. It, um, he's very, he's so engaging and, um, very, very intelligent. And so it was just a, that was my surprise is it, it, it was, I didn't expect that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a great answer. Mm-hmm. Well, because it just goes to show you that, you know, what Wayne was saying about the brand, there's an, a level of that's that's Wayne Lucas. That's the Wayne Lucas we know and we love. Right. But that's also there's a level of that's the brand, like the personal, the person. Obviously, that's why we wanted to do this really with both of you as well, is because I think sometimes, yes, people do. I always tell the story that when I first, first went, met Wayne Lucas, I was at Saratoga. I think it was in like 1991 or something. I can't even remember. It was just, it was that long ago. I was a teenager. And I walked up to him after, Wayne, you had just won a race. You won a graded stake. And um, I, 
basically walk up to you for your autograph. And I actually was too afraid to come up to you. People who know me are like, what? You were like intimidated? Like, no. I, I was intimidated to go up to you. So my cousin kind of orchestrates it. I come up to you to get your autograph. And you were just like so, you know, there weren't any cameras or anything, but you were just so... You were, you were wonderful. You were, you know, you were very charismatic and you were very nice and you were very polite. And, and I always tell people, and I think I've told you, Wayne, this is that I would have been honestly broken. I would have been so gutted if you had been mean to me or you had dismissed me or you had been rude. Like it would have really gutted me because you were such a big idol um, of mine. And I think it just goes back to what Lori's saying about getting to know you. Don't you think that image, like you see some people in racing, you think you know them. We think we know them, but we really don't know them. Well, and unfortunately, I never... sometimes it's an unpleasant surprise, but in this yes. scenario, it's a very yeah. pleasant surprise. Yeah. 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 I don't ever turn down an opportunity to take a picture. And now with everybody as a camera, you know, years ago, they had to have a camera. Now those phones, everybody's got one. But it, I think that as you get to where I've been and, and been as fortunate and blessed as I've been, that I owe it to the industry to never turn down uh, an autograph or a picture or anything. And I make a point not to, and Lori's the worst. She, she promotes it. Oh yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> she grabs it puts them over next to me. Now you want one for grandmother here? I'll take another one. You guys are wonderful. I think we are just about out of time. Christina, if you want to ask any final questions, but I'm, this was wonderful. It's the only word I can come up with. <laughs> I, you know, the one thing I wanted to, what, the only thing I would want to say is just because I've seen the dynamic between Wayne and Lori for a while now. Again, we worked pretty closely together for a while there. And, and you know, Wayne, definitely, Lori, I don't know if the word, the right word is she softens you a little bit, but she definitely, there are times when I've noticed that, you know, we don't know sometimes what's going to come out of Wayne's mouth. Like he will say something <laughs> and it's so in your face. But Lori, you just put such a, you're just such a, a wonderful uh, moderating force on him that I've seen that just that you guys are just such a, a lovely couple because you really compliment each other. And I don't know. I mean, obviously I don't know if you guys work at it or it just happens. No, we Thank don't you. work at it. She, she'll say every once in a while, I don't think you should have said that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so funny that you mentioned that though, Christina, because I feel like my mom and dad were very similar in that uh, my dad, you never knew what was coming out of his mouth. And most of the time they were, jokes that were you know appropriate sometimes inappropriate and my mom would always follow in tow behind him apologizing <laughs> for uh, when you're in the race business you have a tendency to kind of call it like it is you just yes. uh, you say it you the general public sometimes is not ready for it <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, thank you both for joining us again. Uh, it just, um, I, as you know, both Gabby and I, you know, we have the world of respect for both of you. Uh, we love you very much. Uh, again, Wayne, you've been such a part of my life for so, so many years that I feel so blessed uh, that, you know, you're, you've been part of our life. And uh, we, we, we thank you for joining us. <laughs> And just like that, they turned the lights out. <laughs> wow, that was like great timing. Turn off the lights, the party's over. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, well, we just concluded this episode with D. Wayne Lucas and Lori Lucas's wife. Um, I'm still processing everything. This went in so many different directions, but Christina, what was at least one of your takeaways. I'm sure you have many. I, you know, I don't even know where to start because I just, I think I've always had a world of respect for Wayne. That goes back, you know, probably 30 years now. Uh, and, you know, we talked a little bit about winning colors and that's really the era that I got involved in horse racing. And I really started watching was in the 80s. And Wayne was just, you know, at the zenith at that, at that point in his career. But what I've really gotten to appreciate that I think is reflected in this podcast, Gappy, is the man. He really is, there's, a, there's an image of him that everybody sees. That's true. That's part of him. But really, the man, Wayne Lucas, the man, is really something 
it's a little bit different than what a lot of people might realize and he's just he's a wonderful not only is he a charismatic man and he's very uh, obviously he's very clever and he's very intelligent and he's all of those things but really i just adore him he's he has really such a good heart his heart is in the right place and uh i really enjoyed this call he's so thoughtful and a lot of the time when you see someone in a position of of power like that or of greatness and which he has achieved in this industry um, they can be a little bit selfish, I guess, in some cases, but he is the complete opposite of that. Um, he has spent his career teaching others underneath of him that they go on and have successful careers. He's the first person that brings a group of kids into the winner circle so that they have that experience as well. Um, he just gives, 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 gives. And it's just, it was such a pleasure to have him on and just get to know, like you said, the man a little bit more. We know all of that he's achieved in horse racing. We're sitting in the Kentucky Derby. I'm sitting in the Kentucky Derby Museum and there's a whole room for him and his trophies. We know that what he's achieved, but what we don't really know is the man. And I'm just so thrilled to have that opportunity today to kind of take a deep dive into, into that aspect of him. Well, you know, he also, he understands the importance of his influence. And he's been a guy that's really understood the importance of his influence for a very long time. And I wish, honestly, you know, a lot of other people might under, have understood that and might have take, um, as give it as much importance uh, as Wayne does, because he really feels it's it's a it's not only a privilege, but it's also something that it's incumbent on him to to basically guide the next generation or to or to be that type of influence. And you mentioned the Kentucky Derby Museum. If you haven't gone to the museum to to see the exhibit, you really got to go. I mean, the trophies again, the history, the just the, the magnitude of it is just really out of this world. You'll really appreciate it. If you're a Wayne Lucas fan, you definitely want to go to the Derby Museum and pick up a or copy of, <laughs> and, and pick up a, a copy of Sermon of the Mount in the Derby Museum of <laughs> a gift shop yeah. too. <laughs> well, Christina, this was an absolute pleasure. I feel like every single episode we do, it just gets better and better and better. And um, yeah, this I, this was just at the top of the list for me just because of how much I adore D. Wayne Lucas and appreciate the time that he has given us throughout the years. Well, and I think that, you know, to your point, Gabby, so many people love D. Wayne Lucas, and I think so many people will appreciate this show. So you really, uh, you got to check this one out because there's something for everybody in here. All right. Thanks for watching another episode of Let's Talk.